Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm very excited because we have a very special guest today. Her name is Cynthia Benson Mercer, and she is an author and an executive coach, and she helps people in help them with their mid-career. She helps them realize who they are as a person and help, helps them evolve into what they need to do for themselves in order to reach their goals and to rise above the chaos and reach their true potential in life and be the person that they were meant to be. I am so honored to have you on the show, Cynthia, and it's a real pleasure to have you here today. Can you tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do? Yeah, first of all, Stacy, thank you for having me. It is such a privilege and honor to um, to be with you. So I um, basically spent about 30 plus years in corporate America, a lot of different industries, predominantly in human resources. So people focused. Um, and I knew that someday I really wanted to spend time focusing on helping women to truly amplify their potential and helping men to be great allies and sponsors. And um, with a little disruption in my career journey through a CEO change and a, and a shift in leadership, I was gifted that opportunity when my position was eliminated from the corporate world um, just about a year ago. And uh, I had written a book at that point. It was just going to editing. And uh, so it accelerated my next, it accelerated my pace to the thing I thought I'd be doing three to five years from now, I get to do straight away. And that is really executive coaching. I do group coaching, spend a lot of time doing public speaking, um, working with com companies, employee resource groups, associations. Um, but my true love is, is leaning in and focusing on women and helping them truly live into their greatest potential. I love it. I love it. And you talk a lot about your mid-career. And then you also emphasized to me that you had mentioned that a lot of women feel very guilty about taking care of themselves, about self-care, self-love. And in order for us to really excel in life and to really reach our true potential, we really need to focus on ourselves. And I see that so much in society. I see a lot of women are, you know, they feel this guilt or shame to help themselves and to do things for themselves before they help the rest of the family. They feel like they have to always tend to everyone else and they neglect themselves. And in the long run, they're actually hurting themselves. And you could even see it. You could see it physically on their face, on their body, the way they act, their personality. It's all changed. And I think it has to do a lot about not caring and not loving themselves as much as they should. What's mm -hmm. your intent on that? Yeah, I think it's, I and for, for women who are working outside the home, it's, it's a dual edge sword, right? Because um, they tend to do more, raise their hand more, contribute more, offer to help more in the workplace and feel guilty that they're not home. Mm -hmm. And then at home, they're trying to take every care of everyone else around them um, and, and sometimes feeling guilty that they're not at work. And yeah. so they're the last person on the priority list. They're, they're not necessarily anywhere on the top five. If you ask a lot of successful women, you know, where they rank in terms of the priority of time spent, it's not even on one hand. And yeah. so one of the things that, that I think is so important is that, and you, you mentioned this is, you know, the old adage of put your mask on first, the bottom line is we are only as, um, capable and available to be fully present and, um, healthy in a whole way when we've taken a bit of self-care. And, yeah. and see that not so much as a selfish motive or opportunity, but something that really is about making certain that we show up as our best selves. So we spend a lot of time helping women think about creating healthy boundaries yeah. at work and at home to create a little bit of space to invest in themselves, guilt-free and unapologetic. I love that. I love that. Now, a lot of people might not understand when you say mid-career, you know, what exactly is a woman's mid-career? Like, what angle are you trying to explain? Like, maybe you could explain to people what mid-career is and what it stands for in a woman's life. Yeah, I think sometimes, and it's interesting, we had already published the book and were out uh, keynote speaking when it 
I, I, it became aware to me, I became aware that mid-career didn't mean the same thing to everybody that heard the words. So I appreciate you asking. For us, when we think about mid-career, it's not midlife. So it doesn't mean someone in their 40s or 50s. It's not age-related. And it's not mid-level. It doesn't mean that you are at a certain level in a corporate environment. What it is, is it's that three plus decades of a woman's career, generally around, if we were going to put ages on it, around 28 years old-ish to 60 and growing. Yeah. And so it's kind of just past that emerging where you're just sort of getting your feet wet. And what we know about women in particular in that three plus decades of life is if they're working outside the home, they're also statistically still doing the the lion's share of the caregiving, whatever that means in their life, whether they have kids or don't have kids, or they have a spouse or significant other, a community, a church, what have you, we tend to pour into others. We find someone to nurture. And yeah. so because of that, that three plus decades becomes really complex where there's so much on our plates that we tend to put ourselves last, number one. And women are also conditioned in particular to put our heads down work hard and wait for good things to happen. And because time is so elusive and because we're so busy during those three plus decades, we sort of take that advice as the path of least resistance. If I just put my head down, work hard, over index on performance, I can take care of everybody else. And when it's my turn, I'll get tapped. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that's really true. And I think what people don't understand is that if you put your head down and you're waiting to get tapped, you, you're not going to get tapped. You know, right. it's just, you really have to really take the initiative. And I think a lot of women don't take the initiative. And, and I think maybe, maybe they're afraid or, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they're, you know, uh, you know, there's a reason behind that. Do you, it, do you find that when you were talking to a lot of different women and working with a lot of different women, why that is? I think it, I think it for the most part starts with this, just not making ourselves a priority. We just don't take the time. We put it off, right? It's I'll start working on that when the kids go off to kindergarten or when they graduate college or when um, my parents are in a, you know, a better place where, where caregiving happens or my significant other lands, the dream job. So yeah. there's a lot of putting it off because we've taken on so much and, and our me message straight away is start working on your future today. So you can do your day job with excellence. Mm -hmm. Don't take your eye off the ball, but to your point, if you're looking down and waiting to get tapped, that's just not how society works. It's right. the people that are looking up and looking forward and being intentional about mm -hmm. their career journey. So, to, so partly to answer your question, when we studied women, um, five race ethnicities, four countries, um, a span of 30 years of age, um, 900 years of collective experience, I mean, really successful women. What we found is to a person at some point along the way throughout their mid-career and sometimes multiple times, they woke up one day and felt restless. Mm -hmm. They felt stuck, stagnant, restless, you know, that feeling. And the cause of it was I, they didn't feel actualized. They had more talent to give, more value to add, more to share, more to do. Yeah. And so our approach really is intentionality. So mm -hmm. we don't ignore societal norms and factors and barriers and cultural norms. We address it. We recognize it. But what we say is, we're not solving that in a day. What mm -hmm. we are going to do is help women to take back their agency, to look mm -hmm. up and to look forward and to be more intentional. I think that's so important. I think one of the things you said is really important to emphasize on is that women need to feel accomplished. Women need to feel that they're valued, that they have a purpose in life. You know, when you go through life and you don't feel like you have a purpose, if you don't feel like you're beat, you have a sense of accomplishment, like you're doing something that's worthy. You know, a lot of times you can feel that a woman's self-esteem goes down and they really aren't feeling that, you know, what they're doing is, is it, it's, 
it's below them in a sense, you know, they don't feel like they're really giving it their all. And, you know, a lot of times I think that can really damper on a woman's self-esteem as well. So I really think it's important that women feel a sense of accomplishment because like you, you made a statement before, if you don't feel a sense of accomplishment, I feel like a lot of women's self-esteem will go down mm -hmm. and they'll feel unworthy. And I think that happens a lot in society is that women, you know, they're doing this much when they can be doing this much and they know it and they know it. And I, I feel that it really can damper a person's self-esteem. And, you know, when that happens, you know, they they just don't feel like they're really doing what they can. They they feel they're not they're not happy. And you can see it in their faces, you know, and, and, and some people are scared to make, you know, to change and to to take that leverage, you know, and take it up, you know, elevate themselves to the new level. But, you know, I think by working on their self-esteem and really realizing how great they are as a person, because I don't think a lot of women, when they when they when they've served everybody else for so long, they don't realize all the great qualities they have within themselves. They're focused so much on everybody else that they don't even know all the great things about themselves. All they know is that they just don't feel happy, probably because they're drained, too. And they have focused on everybody else. And they're not feeling that their dreams and everything that they wanted to do in the back of their head that they put back in there has not been met. Absolutely. And one of the things that I think is so important is two things. One is when we make choices, own those choices as I made that choice because rather than I feel guilty about that, you know, this or that, you know, I didn't have that uniform washed in time or this dinner on the table or, you know, what, whatever it is, um, yeah. or I traveled too much. You know, we look back oftentimes in this reflection of guilt instead of all that we've accomplished. Yeah. And the other thing is we really empower and, and it's just for women to celebrate their wins and don't wait for heroics. Do yeah. a little highlight reel of, the past month, what are the things that you're proud of from the last month? They could be as little as I got little Johnny to school on time every day, right? Whatever yeah. it is. Um, or it could be that I got through that major event that was going on that was super stressful and, and look, it was, it happened and it was amazing. And I'm on the other side of it. What are those little wins and how do you do that highlight reel on a regular basis to say, what can I be proud of? And um, look how far I've come. Instead right. of spending all of that time on what didn't I accomplish? What, where did I fall short? What else could I have done if I'd have just spent more time doing it? I think you're so right. Now, do you like journaling? Because I find that sometimes if we can journal and we can look at the positive things about ourselves, have gratitude, you know, because sometimes, you know, we, the littlest things in life can bring us the most joy, but, mm -hmm. but sometimes we overlook the littlest things in life and we don't realize how, val how, val how much they're valued until they're taken away from us. And then being positive, even if the negative things in our lives happen, if we could pull something positive out of that negative thing, that could strengthen us and give us so much resilience instead of like, you know, being sad because, oh, you know, I'm, you know, my, I didn't get that promotion or I didn't, you know, I didn't accomplish and, and, you know, I didn't make my marker for this month, you know, instead of looking at it that way, like, you know, think about what you did do that was positive during that time. And, you know, you know, the, the work it took and, and how much determination that you, you put forward and how much effort you put forward, just keep focusing on the positive. Are these things that you, you think are very very worthy and it could help women. I think it's critical. And I think it, journaling is an excellent, it works for a lot of people. It could even be for, for some that, that are not as comfortable with journaling, or that's not a strength. It can just be doing affirmations um, in the morning or before bed. Right. It's, it could be verbal affirmations or you sit and you're just mindfulness right around those things. I also think it's really important for men and women um, to ally for each other. And so taking time to celebrate others in terms of 
their their little wins, um, yeah. their affirmations, you know, not not overlooking some of those things for your significant other, for your spouse, for the person that works for you. Um, right. recognizing the importance of how they need to hear those things um, because that bolsters our our confidence as well. So we can be good allies for each other but it also starts with being our own best ally, right? We've got to yes. manage our own internal narrative. One yes. of the things we also, I'm sure Stacey, you're familiar, but um, the the wellness wheel where we really invite women um, to, to stop on a regular basis and sort of check in with how is my mental wellness? How is my spiritual wellness? How is my financial wellness? Yes. Um, how is my relational wellness? to check into those things, physical, et cetera, and to rate them. And yeah. we, we don't give any passes on mental and physical, right? Those, if you're not rating those high enough, that becomes the priority above all else. Yes. Um, if those are in good shape, then we go, okay, so then where do we need to spend some time? What are you, what are you yeah. worried about? And how do you lean into that so that you're really holistically looking at your overall wellness wheel. Um, yeah. Because we're working with a lot of professional women who are balancing lots of things. Yeah. Even when you encourage them to start taking time for themselves, sometimes then that just throws everything else out of balance, right? Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. it's constantly trying to figure out um, uh how do you balance all of the things without getting anything so far out of whack that, you know, you're suffering the consequences? Right. Exactly. Exactly. I think sometimes it's good to, you know, like you mentioned about yoga or doing affirmations in the morning. Mm -hmm. It's so important to like, I think to, to make it a part of your daily routine mm -hmm. and just, you know, to really check in on yourself every day, because you know, with every day comes new obstacles, new things occur in life and it can change you, you know, it can change your thoughts, the way you feel, it can change your stress level. And it's always good to just take a moment in the morning, maybe 15 minutes, you know, to just really think about, you know, how you feel, like you said, mm -hmm. the wellness wheel, go through the wellness wheel in your head and then maybe set some goals, I think too, on how we could actually make ourselves feel better and improve ourselves so the rest of the day goes well and then our future ahead of us is, is is you know strong and we can really move forward in in a positive way i think mm -hmm. what's your take on that I, I i love that and i think the more internal work that that we can do to really um have clarity about how we're showing up on that particular day what's sort of uh -huh. on our minds big fan of putting pen to paper and goal setting. I think that, you know, there's a, a lot of accountability that comes in to putting a goal down on paper, even more accountability. If you can share that with someone. Yeah. Um, one of the things I, I loved that when I was in the corporate world and I've been trying to encourage more people to think about doing this with their friend groups and, and with their teams is to open a conversation with how are you showing up today? And, and the intention is it's short. The answer is not intended to be a long drawn out story, but it's, um, it could be heavy hearted because I received a call from so-and-so about this thing. That's it's really on my mind right? or excited because I, you know, I just learned X, Y, Z and yeah. It just allows you to sort of set that out into the universe, maybe even set it aside for whatever is now going to take place. Now we're going to move into the meeting at hand, Yeah. but there's empathy, there's compassion. That takes a lot of trust. You have yeah. to have an environment of trust to put those really raw feelings out there. But I have seen with teams in particular, where it gives a safe space to sort of say, this thing is on my mind. I've now put it in the universe. I'm going to set it aside. And now I'm fully present. Right. I like that. I like that a lot. I feel it's so important to kind of put things into the universe. I'm very spiritual. And I feel like sometimes if you can just relax, meditate, slow your breathing down and just talk to the universe, talk to, you know, your higher power and just really focus on what your needs are and, you know, just give it up to the, to the universe. 
it kind of relaxes you and puts you in a level of calmness and, and gives you good clarity and you could focus and you start to feel connected, you know, mm -hmm. it, you have a feeling of connection within yourself, which I think is really important as well. We use a model um, related to that when you need to change a negative narrative in your head. So we've all had those times where maybe the boss walks by our office and says, hey, can I chat with you for a minute and, and goes off and all of a sudden you're like, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. what did I do? What am I in trouble for? Or your significant other or spouse is late getting home and, you know, five minutes into you, you've got them off in a ditch, right? Because, yeah. because you haven't heard from them. And so we get into that negative mental space and we use yeah. a, a model that we introduce called um, pause, protest, pivot, and pray. And yeah. the pray is really to be interpreted however your spirituality leads you, right? So, mm -hmm. so it's religion agnostic, um, yeah. but it's, it's you the moment you realize that you're kind of having this negative thought or you're sort of working yourself into a, a frenzy is you pause, you protest that thought. Well, they're probably not really in a ditch. They're probably just running late as usual, or, you know, maybe the, my boss doesn't have anything negative to tell me, or you, you protest. Why would I naturally go to this negative place? Yeah. You pivot, tell yourself, something positive and something different. Maybe they want to promote me. Maybe he or she is stopping to buy me flowers, you know, but whatever. And then pray or put it into the universe of whatever the situation is, you know, I'm going to show up with grace and, and, and give me strength and understanding and all the things. And right. we find that for people that tend to catastrophize, Mm -hmm. This is a really great tool to immediately and as often as necessary sort of interrupt that. And sometimes it's our own negative self-talk about ourselves where we're not fit enough or smart enough or this enough or that enough. And to really interrupt that negative mental energy and to turn yeah. that into something positive and then put it in the universe and move forward, it can be very empowering. Yes. Yes. I think a lot of times you feel, you know, I, I, I speak to women and they have a hard time letting go, you know, just like letting it go from their mind and just, you know, and clear it, clear in their mind. They always say they feel, they feel like it creeps back on into, yes. their, into their mind and they can't, they're, they're trying their best to just like, you know, move forward, but it seems like it always creeps back because I guess it's unsettled emotions, you know? That's right. You know, and I guess, you know, like you said, just really, you know, relaxing and focusing and really just letting it, you know, letting it out there and praying about it and just letting it slowly, you know, well, I guess the more you do that, the more you relax, the more you pray, the more you meditate, the more the wounds can kind of heal itself, just like any wound on your body would if you get yes. a scrape eventually it will heal itself just with time. And sometimes to your point earlier, it's putting it down on paper. It's what works for you individually. Yeah. Um, but for me, I use pause, protest, pivot, pray quite, quite often. But I also, um, if something's really, I can't, you know, sort of brewing, um, yeah. writing it down somehow for me gets it out of my head and onto paper. And then I can physically set it aside Yes. For, for a period of time. Right. Um, and then choose when I, when I'm going to come back to that. Right. And that can be helpful in a lot of ways, personally and professionally. Right. I like that. I like that a lot. I think it's very, very important. I, I remember I used to always like write a journal and I, if, when things came about that were really like hard for me to deal with, I would put it on paper and then I would just keep writing about it until I got to a point where I felt like I passed that point. Mm -hmm. And then I would actually take the papers and I would, I would rip them out of the notebook and then I would get rid of them. I would shred yes. them up and I would throw them out because then they, to me, that was the past. And yes. I felt like now I was in the present and it was no longer a part of me. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great technique, a great tool to, to move past those things. And I think, you know, getting back to sort of our, our specific research is to the extent that you can do that to 
put aside self-limiting beliefs, that mm -hmm. to me is so important for professional women is it's so easy to get in your head and, and, and live into some of those self-limiting beliefs yeah. um, and to redirect those thoughts as often as possible. However, through whatever means works for you, but find one of the tools we've mentioned two or three yeah. that, that help you refocus that energy into channeling it in a positive way because you are worthy and you are talented and you are gifted. And, you know, there's, it's the gifts and talents that we have as, as human beings is indiscriminate. We all have them. Yeah. You know, the question is talent for what figuring out your unique gifts and talents so that you can right. ultimately, if, if you're choosing to work outside the home, that you can make a living doing something that feels more like a hobby yeah. than like work. Right. Which you found right. Stacy, which is what you get yeah. to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what I get to do. Right. Exactly. And I think it's very fulfilling when you can do something that you really enjoy. You know, I think it's so important because there's so many people out there that say, you know, they wake up and they felt like they were dragging their feet every morning. They just, they just really, they, they didn't want to go to work. They didn't want to get out of bed because they knew what was ahead and they weren't happy with what they were doing. But when you have purpose in your life and you have, you feel fulfilled and you feel like you're on a mission and it ignites you, you know, it's a great feeling to be able to do something that you actually love. And then you could even get paid for it. You're doing something that really is meaningful. You're helping people, you know, and it's, it's something that you love to do, you know, and I, you know, I, that's like one of the greatest gifts, you know, and I, everybody has the ability to be able to do that. You yeah, know, absolutely do. Absolutely. And to your point, you know, it, in fact, what, what I really encourage women when I'm coaching them is it starts with making the time, right? We've addressed that. It starts with making the time. Um, the very the very next thing that we talk about is proclaiming your purpose, not mm -hmm. not the mission statement on somebody else's wall, and yes. not the values that somebody else has in their handbook. What right. is your mission statement? What is your what are your list of values? Your non negotiables? Your vision for the future? And. Yes that becomes so foundational. And then yes. you couple that with what are my gifts and talents? Yes. What are the things that I do spontaneously, consistently, naturally, better than most, and that fill my cup, give me intrinsic satisfaction. When yes. you, you know, maybe it's that you love being creative or you're relational or you're highly analytical or you're a problem solver. What is that space that when you're naturally living into that gift, it feels so fun and so good and so empowering and liberating and you're super good at it. Yeah. Go find, go find work that allows you to do more of that or, or right. go it, as you think about your next, as you think about your aspiration, what is that degree, that certification, that expansion of your position, et cetera, even that industry that allows you to live into those things more because then yeah. you achieve what you've just mentioned, right? Which is you're not dragging most days. I mean, nothing's perfect, yeah. but most days you're excited because you get paid to do what you love. Right. Exactly. And I, I don't think sometimes I, I, people, people don't realize that they could actually do that. You know, mm -hmm. they are just so used to living in this specific environment and they've been taught this specific way from their parents or wherever they grew up and they feel like, go get a job. You have to, you know, bring home the paycheck. You have to do this and da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. But it could be a lot more than that. You know, your, your mid career could be something very fulfilling, something that you've always dreamed of doing something that will, you know, bring, you know, you know, fulfillment, joy, happiness into your life where you could feel productive and you are proud of who you are and what you've become. Mm -hmm. And you look forward to what the future has in store for you. Yeah. It's interesting too, because I think about some of the generational dif differences and this has come up on a few calls and meetings I've been on recently. Um, I even, I even think about conversations I've had with my niece and, you know, there's a, there's this movement and this shift to work-life balance yeah. more so than ever that we're seeing in the, the, the next generation entering the workforce. They don't want to, um, 
live to work. And yeah. They want to work to live. I've heard that expressed. And what yeah. I would offer is this, first of all, I think work-life balance is probably not even a thing. I think it's work-life integration. Yeah. Um, but the thing that I said to my niece, which I think she's recently found and now she believes me, is when you are in a space that you love what you do and it truly is playing to what you were called to, to be involved in and to do, it doesn't feel like work. And therefore that work-life integration becomes very natural. I think what so many of the generation observed were their parents who worked and worked and worked and spent all these hours and, and maybe weren't very fulfilled and were grumpy when they got home and, you know, um, and maybe quite companies weren't as loyal to that person as um, one would have hoped, you know, from the, from the perspective of, of the, the family. But I think it does get back to, if you love what you do, mm -hmm. then it integrates pretty, pretty darn easily. Yeah, definitely. Oh, I agree. I agree totally. If you have to really love what you do, you have to really, if you love what you do, I think it does integrate very easily because it, there's no second thought. You're just doing something that you enjoy and, and you're not self-doubting yourself. You're not, right. you know, and, and, and when you love something, you just motivated to just want to do, 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 do. That's exactly know? right. Yeah. You know? And it's when you're not motivated, then it's like, it's a chore and then mm -hmm. it's draining. And then, mm -hmm. you know, I think, like you said, I, I like the fact that you said work-life integration, you know, it's like, you know, because they use that terminology, work-life balance a lot. And there's a lot of people who say, I don't think it's work-life balance. You know, I think that term is used too much, you know, and uh, you do, you have to, you have to just do things that you enjoy. And there, you know, there, I think there's something out there for everybody. It's mm -hmm. just figuring out what that something is for you. That's exactly right. And, and understanding yourself is the first piece of the, of the answer to that puzzle. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think that, that, you know, sometimes people, you know, they've been given labels for so long that they don't really realize who they are. Cause like, if you take all those labels away and you ask, you know, I've done that to people. All right, let's take away the mom label. Let's take away this label. Let's take away that label. Okay. Now, who are you? Right. And they just and they look at me with this clouded look, like very confused, like, I don't know, you mm -hmm. know? And it's like, you know, if you didn't have all these things, all these labels, you know, who would you be? You know, right? they just, and they sit there and they just don't know. They don't know the answer and, and they're thinking and they're not really sure, you know? We're seeing that a lot with, I mean, and it happens to men as well, but I, I will tell you, we're seeing a lot of that with women who are approaching what we call their encore career. So mm -hmm. uh, retiring this notion of retirement, but as women are working longer and have poured into their professions in those last, you know, 20 years and so on, and, and then ultimately decide to move into their encore, their oftentimes their retirement. Yeah. They don't have as many hobbies. Right. Um, again, we don't make time and space for that. You know, I can't, uh, now there's an exception to everything and I'm being a little, uh, this is a general statement, but you know, more men will find time to go spend five hours on the golf course. And by the way, I applaud that they're out with their buddies and they're doing their thing. Many women, particularly professional women can't imagine how they would invest five hours of time because they're doing all the 97,000 other things that they're making up for on the weekends. And that is not yeah. an indictment of men. I will tell you over and over again, we say we need to take a page out of their playbook. This yeah. isn't a finger wagging at men. This is, you know, in right. some ways they've really got this right. Um, yeah. But the point in that is they'll, that, that as women leave the workforce, they're kind of falling off a cliff because mm -hmm. to your point about labels, they're now empty nesters. If they had children, mm -hmm. they are no longer the, whatever they were called in the corporate environment that they built their careers on. Right. They've not really built a lot around themselves in terms of um, hobbies and things that they enjoy doing. And they yeah. might even have left their friend group um, not as strengthened as they would like, right? Because they're, yeah. they're 
so busy with everything else. And they, they're they not sure what their sense of purpose and value is at that point. Yeah. And so to that point, really being that clarity is is through your life. It, there's not yeah. a point where that ends. Somebody needs to be expecting you somewhere. Right. Through your entire life. Yes, exactly. A hundred percent. And it, and it, and it changes as you get older. And, and it's, I think having hobbies and doing things you enjoy are so important. And a lot of women don't take enough of time to do those things. They may do it once in a while, but it should be an ongoing thing that they consistently do that brings them some kind of joy and help. And, you know, these are things that also relax you and makes you more than just a business person, you know, more than just a career woman, you know, you're, you have all these different interests, all these different things, it fulfills you. You're filling the circle. Mm-hmm. Now That's it's not just a quarter of the circle, I think. Mm-hmm. What do you think. Yeah. And like you said, when you take the titles away, what's left and, and how do you, how do you lean into that a little bit more to say, okay, in advance of no longer being the C, whatever, the VP of whatever, whatever, yeah. um, How are you nurturing those other gifts and talents so that when that label goes away, you have this other place to spend your time and focus and energy? Maybe it's volunteer work. Maybe it's serving on boards. Maybe it's, um, you know, a, a sport or a creative outlet, what have you, but something that gives you that place of who you are outside of mom, wife, partner corporate executive, what have you. Exactly. Exactly. And I, that that's something I think that every woman should really take the time out to do. Like we're going back to our self-care and self-love. You really should take the time to really put those, those, those hobbies and those interests. And, you know, some people might love to do yoga, you know, mm-hmm. but they have strayed away from it because they have gotten so preoccupied with everything else by the end of the day, they're too tired or they wake up and they right away, they have to do this and this and this and everything they used to love to do. They no longer do. And that also is why women's cortisol level goes so high and mm-hmm. why they, you know, it, it, life gets a little stressful you know, we have to really learn how to, I think, have everything in a, in, a, in a balance, you know, try to balance out our lives, you know, and it's funny when you talked about empty nesters, I was like, I didn't know what to do when all my kids left. I was like, I went out and got a Shih Tzu. I was like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have to have somebody to live on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. Mm-hmm. There's a I- woman named Carla Olson that has started um, an organization, the Empty Nester Club. And for your women listeners that maybe are um, at the point where they're seeing their high school age kids are going to be going off soon, or perhaps that's fairly recent. Um, she has a book coming out. She has an amazing website and the work she's doing to really help women prepare for that that time because it's yeah. incredibly stressful and anxiety, even especially for women who have um, stayed home because yeah. that has been, they've been the COO of that household and that's been their core job. And yeah. um, it can, that label feels really difficult when that feels stripped away during that oh, time. Yeah. So yeah, she's a great, a great resource. I know, and I know in our podcast, when women have come on and talked about empty nesters, it has skyrocketed because it it really does affect a lot of women, you know, Mm -hmm. more than, you know, it's just like, it's, it's a big issue because once, once everyone's out of the house and all those labels are gone, you know, like what next, you know, especially if you don't have a career and that's when I think it's important to, when you go into your mid career, okay, you know, the kids are gone, you know, what can I do that will bring me joy, you know, and what can I, you know, do that that will bring me fulfillment in my life? One. Yes, absolutely. And, and if you can prepare for that intentionally before they're out of the house so that you've got a little bit of runway, 
Yeah. Um, and you're accelerating speed by the time they launch, you have already been working toward that. It it moves you into that next phase. And I yeah. think that's where Carla's work and 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 our work really have come together is this notion of intentionality. Right. I think that's so important. Now you wrote a book. Tell me a little about the book that you wrote with Carla. So I wrote it with Kimberly, actually. Carla oh, has a, yeah, yeah, Kimberly okay. Rath. Yes, it's called Now Near Next. Um, it is a practical guide for mid-career women to move from professional serendipity to intentional advancement. Um, it's a long mouthful to say, we really help women to start working on their future today. And right. it's um, very action oriented. There's a companion guide um, that you can use to journal right along as you're reading, or you can simply pull a notebook out and use that to journal along. But it's it's really a practical step by step from let's focus on time, let's build out the purpose, let's understand talent, and so on. Um, and yeah, it's impacting a lot of women around the world. And we're in the process of publishing a companion guide for men. Um, like and women, that. but we've had a lot of requests for men to say, if I have a, a woman in, or woman or women in my life who are pursuing their next, they're working on what's next for them. How can I yeah. show up as an ally? And so um, we have an allyship guide coming out in um, October 1st. And I think that's so important because when you do know that your, 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 uh, your partner supports you, it, it means a lot. And it really can help strengthen the relationship and it just to have that support or just them to like take interest in it is huge. Mm -hmm. It's huge. Yes. You don't yes. feel like you're by yourself or you don't feel like, you know, unsupported and, and that what you're doing is not important. You know, you feel that, okay, this person values what I'm doing because they're taking interest in, in what I'm doing. And, you know, to have their support and to have them by your side, it, it, it really goes a long way. And it could actually even strengthen the relationship overall. Absolutely. I think, I think what's beautiful about it is exactly what you said, is that it really creates this partnership. I also um, think that as men and women are leaders and people of influence in the workforce, mm -hmm. this is an opportunity to help lift other people up, whoever that is, whoever needs that lift. This is really about how do you support and sponsor those that are trying to work toward their aspiration and yeah. maybe for whatever reason, societal, uh, cultural, et cetera, um, don't have the same opportunities. Yeah. This is a way that you can really lean into those individuals and help support them, um, to achieve their, achieve their goals and aspirations. I love it. I love it. Now, where can people find your book? So our book is at Amazon and all uh, places where quality books are sold. And mm -hmm. um, our companion guide is there as well. So you can get the companion guide and the book on Amazon. And then you can find myself and my business partner at zealoftheheel.com. <laughs> and it's heel like the shoe, H-E-E-L. So <laughs> zealoftheheel.com on all the social handles. I love it. I love it. Now, what are some of the services that you provide for everybody? Thank you for asking. Um, so we do a fair amount of keynote speaking with associations, employee resource groups, et cetera. Um, a real core competency of mine and, and the place that I get a lot of joy and fulfillment is doing executive coaching. So I work with a lot of C-suite um, and VP level men and women, um, men on organization and leadership and allyship and women on their career trajectory. Yeah. And then I do um, also have master classes where we literally take the book over six months and we bring together a really dynamic group of five or six women. And over six months, we work through the book and yeah. they end with having uh, their blueprint for their next completely ready to go. So a number of different ways and some organizational consulting um, in the margins. I love it. I love it. Now, if you had to take today's talk, everything that we talked about in today's conversation, how, how would you like to like some turning points? What would you emphasize on that you think would, the, would value the listener? You know, so some of the like little synopsis of what we talked about today, some turning points that you think they would really value from. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I always come back to our through line, which is start working on your future today. 
-hmm. not putting it off, not waiting until this other thing happens. I think that's so important. That starts with creating healthy boundaries to make space for yourself. Yeah. And because the first thing we hear is great start working on my future today, but when, when am I supposed to do that? Right. I would Mm -hmm. tell you seven minutes a day. It's, it's more than five. It's not as many as 10. It's a great place to start. Listen to seven minutes of a podcast, read seven minutes of an article, do seven minutes of research, something that pours into what you identify as your next, um, be very clear on your own purpose and realize the incredible gifts that you uniquely have mm-hmm. and turn that into a question of how can I make a living at that? Yeah. Doing more of that. And then finally, I think um, the pause, protest, pivot, pray tool that I've shared with you is something to get out of your own head. So if you're one that's struggling with imposter syndrome or my limiting beliefs, I don't know that I could do that. I'm not ready. I'm not enough. You're enough. You're Mm -hmm. more than enough. And, um, you're the, you're the person that you need to convince of that. I love it. I love it. This is amazing. I, I really enjoyed having you on the show today. I think you really made some really valuable points. I, I think women, you know, in their mid career really need to establish, you know, who they are, what they want to do, and they have to be happy, you know, and not, not drag themselves and do the things they, they don't want to do. And, and if they do sometimes have that inner feeling inside, like, I, I think I'm ready for a change it, to, to really go with it and, and don't stop themselves, you know, to really look at what their needs are. And, and the most important thing, like you said in the beginning is to show some self-care and self-love. I think once you show yourself some care and some self-love, all these things will start to flow and, you know, and, you know, all the different things that you've mentioned today, you know, as you go along, it'll all start to open up and you'll start to realize the purpose and the things that you really want to do and and who you are and how to, you know, go about it. I think, I think what you're doing is fabulous. And I love, I love how you're really helping women to really evolve to, to the, their peak and to be able to be the person they want to be and not be someone that, you know, someone else wants them to be. Stacey, I think you summarized that so beautifully and it has been such a delight and pleasure to spend this time with you. So thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you so much for being here. I had a great time. Thank you. You too. Have a great day. You too.